Hello, my name is Rick Bacon. I'm the Chief Executive of Aquametrology Systems. And this is going to be a brief overview of our technology portfolio, um, the various products we have, have developed, and their application, and why they bring and how they bring benefits uh, to the water industry, whether that's drinking water, wastewater, or industrial process water. Our technologies sit in uh, two uh, broad families of activity. Uh, the first is AMS Analytics, and the second is AMS Environment. AMS Analytics includes a portfolio of online analyzers and bench top analyzers, uh, which are focused on monitoring contaminants of concern. These are regulatory contaminants or contaminants that can prejudice industrial processes, for example, contaminants in a uh, semiconductor factory. The contaminants themselves fall into three broad categories, uh, trilomethanes, which are um, the byproduct, a carcinogenic byproduct of the chlorination of um, uh, in drinking water, uh, trace metals like arsenic, lead, uh, copper, chrome, um, zinc, uh, basically the uh, periodic table with one or two exceptions. And then finally, uh, organics, um, which are often associated with wastewater treatment plants. AMS environment uh, includes our in situ uh, stannous and tin dioxide generator, uh, which we uh, patented, developed a couple of years ago, and which has a broad range of applications for both treating uh, contaminants that are found in water as well as airborne contaminants. Uh, so, first, our uh, analyzers. Um, the boxes are very interesting, but in fact, uh, what we're actually really delivering to our clients is data. Uh, but just so you can identify them, uh, on the left there, we have an online trace metal analyzer. Uh, this is a duo version, so there's actually two analyzers within that. Um, this is for a semiconductor plant uh, where space is limited and where therefore combining two analyzers in one um, was um, a requirement of the client. Um, one, in fact, is measuring very, very high levels of copper before a treatment process, and then the other, the copper after a treatment process, uh, with built-in redundancy between the two. Uh, the second instrument there is our first product, uh, launched, developed uh, 10 years ago, uh, an online trihalomethane analyzer uh, for monitoring uh, disinfection byproducts. Uh, we'll come to that later and then um, the online uh, inorganic analyzer. Uh, then uh, we have two uh, benchtop analyzers. The first is for monitoring trace metal. So it's a sister to the instrument on the far left. The same technology, but in bench scale format uh, with an auto sample. So this can do very rapid turnaround of hundreds of samples, which are in the auto sampler there um, for, for metals of concern and then a benchtop uh, trihalomethane analyzer. Um, and these are, this portfolio is really a response to the range of demands of our clients in um, you know, different sectors of the water industry. So a bit about uh, why online analyzers um, have a place in the market. Uh, in many ways, we at AMS have been developing this market. Um, because up until online instrumentation, really the only way of understanding what was in a water sample was what most people think of doing, um, uh, taking a sample. And if this is a um, sort of an, a regulatory reading, which is what most laboratory-based uh, sampling is about, uh, that has to be collected in a certain way, uh, you know, following very uh, specific protocols, uh, transported, to an EAPA approved laboratory under again strict protocol strict protocols, uh, which could include uh, refrigerating the sample uh, to a laboratory, again, strict protocols there, uh, analyzed, um, then quality control and assurance. And then seven to ten days later, yeah, the data having been validated, cross-checked is uh, a report is issued. Um, so that's very much a regulatory focus. Our, um, our focus is somewhat different. 
uh, I'll come to the value of the data in a second, but to um, essentially what we have to do is automate that whole process from beginning to end so that um, we have to take a sample, a representative sample, um, in the analytical process before we can even start analyzing it, we need to make sure that that sample um, doesn't contain um, interferences, or if it doesn't contain interferences, uh, the, uh, the impact of those interferences is eliminated from the analytical process. Because, um, I mean, to give you an example of what I mean by that, uh, we might be looking, for example, for selenium in uh, the uh, waste stream of a coal power plant. Uh, if any of you have seen that, it's full of suspended solids. It looks a bit like an ugly Turkish coffee. Um, and buried in there will be selenium uh, in amongst organic and inorganics and other metals. So we need to be able to get at um, all of the selenium in that sample, not half of it. It's no good measuring accurately a half of the selenium there. You've got to get all the selenium and then measure it accurately. So what, um, that involves a lot of sample preparation uh, with acids and heat and ultraviolet in order to uh, extract the contaminant of concern. So sample preparation. Uh, we then move on to measurement, the actual measurement itself. Uh, there are two principal technologies we employ, uh, colometry and voltammetry. Uh, the method is according to the contaminant of concern. Uh, voltammetry is by far the most reliable, accurate way of uh, monitoring, measuring uh, trace metals. And colorimetry is um, the most accurate, reliable way of measuring uh, THMs. Um, colorimetry involves um, adding the contaminant or sample uh, with the contaminant in it uh, to some reagents. Uh, and the change of color and the depth of change of color in just a few seconds uh, will uh, we can analyze and that will indicate how much of the contaminant is present, THMs, uh, very accurately and reliably. And voltammetry uses a different method that uh, generates the same accurate and reliable results. Uh, many K times, um, uh, the, um, the contaminant is present in different forms uh, and the client needs to know what those different forms are. So. Um, an example would be um, lead, so lead in drinking water. Um, a simple uh, analysis with a handheld uh, analyzer will tell you how much dissolved lead is present. Um, and that's fine, except that uh, also present almost certainly will be particulate lead. Um, that has to also be uh, analyzed. So um, again, coming to the pretreatment mo module, we will first measure the dissolved lead, uh, and then uh, we will digest um, the uh, particulate lead that's in the sample we've taken and measure again. And that will give us a measure of total lead, which is actually the number that people should be worried about uh, when they're looking at lead uh, analytical results. And then it's all very well measuring something, uh, but can you trust the measurement? Is there a false positive or a false negative? Uh, it's a bit like um, if you get on the, uh, the bathroom scales, uh, can you trust uh, uh, the weight reading that you get? Um, if it's um, you know, false positive, um, it's telling you that um, you know, your weight's just fine. Uh, false negative, uh, it's telling you that um, uh, you're, you're, you're overweight and um, uh, you need to go on a diet. And in fact, the reading is wrong. So telling you that you're fine uh, or that you need to go on a diet when in fact those are false results is not very helpful. And the same applies to an analyzer. Uh, the data that we're generating, as you'll see in a second, is uh, mission critical. And so we need to be able to eliminate that risk. How do you eliminate that risk uh, with the bathroom scales where you put a 25 pound weight of something on the scales and see whether it measures 25 pounds? And if it doesn't, you adjust the scales accordingly, if you're being honest with yourself. Uh, the same here. Uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. So we constantly calibrate and validate the results to ensure uh, that uh, the client can trust them and take uh, appropriate action. And then the data is reported through a whole range of different uh, ways, uh, telemetry, SCADA systems, 
uh, whichever way the client requires uh, the data to be delivered to them. Uh, the cycle time uh, is pretty quick, or can be very pretty quick. Uh, water quality can change quite quickly from moment to moment, and so cycle times need to be uh, pretty short. Not always, uh, so there's always a range, and sometimes in any case, uh, the analytical process, particularly if we're doing some um, uh, sample preparation work, can be, uh, be longer. Uh, but in general, that's the range. Uh, and it op they operate, have to operate 24 by 7 by 365 because that's what, what knows the conditions underwater treatment plants operate. Um, and finally, they need to be accurate and reliable. Um, the EPA standard for something you send, uh, for example, sent to them is plus or minus 25%. Um, that's deemed to be accurate enough for uh, people's health. It's certainly not uh, desirable, that range. Uh, for um, process optimization and some of the other applications we're going to come to in a minute. So we have, our analyzers are um, very accurate and very reliable by comparison. And that's partly made possible because there isn't all the handling and steps that I described of getting a, um, a lab sample result. There's plenty of scope for human error in the way the sample is collected, the way it's transported, uh, the analyzer itself at the other end, um, and so on. So um, that gives you an idea. And I look at I, one way of thinking about this is uh, we are to labs uh, what Google Maps was to Rand McNally. Um, if you don't know where you are and you pick up a Rand McNally uh, map, uh, that's not going to be very helpful. It doesn't, won't tell you where you are and how you went and how to get to your um, destination. Uh, with Google, you can identify your location. Uh, it'll tell you exactly where you are. It'll tell you how, wait, how to get to where you want to get to. And if you deviate, uh, it will get you back on track. Um, so hopefully that uh, metaphor explain, you know, explains the difference between um, the two of us. So now some of the very specific um, uh, advantages of our analyzers compared to the generality. Uh, we have patented uh, very sensitive uh, sensors, and these are essential for being able to measure uh, contaminants down to uh, very, very low PPD, one PPD or even lower. And to give you an idea of what a PPD is, it's a thimbleful in an oil tanker of water. So um, being able to measure that requires some very sophisticated instrumentation. Um, the sensor recovery technology is very important because uh, sensors, all of them, don't believe what people tell you, degrade um, over time. Uh, they can get clogged, they can get contaminated, all sorts of things. Um, we have proprietary for all of our sensors, a, a proprietary way of ensuring uh, that they are uh, kept clean. And if they're kept clean, they're, they are reliable. Uh, lack of cleanliness, um, contamination is the, um, is the ruin of many sensor technologies. And this again comes back to the repeatability. It's no good, you know, the, the sensor being beautiful one moment, beautiful result, five minutes time, it's uh, contaminated and you're getting a completely different result. Which result do you believe? Um, and then finally, as I discussed uh, earlier, the sample preparation technology, which is so important to ensuring that you've got a representative sample to, uh, to analyze. Uh, the self calibration and validation uh, I described. Um, uh, th this is also important because if it doesn't do it, you've got to send someone to do it. Uh, many instruments require that. Uh, that's sort of okay if it's the, the instrument is in uh, the water treatment plant close to hand, but you still need skilled labor to do it. But um, the idea of these instruments is that they can operate unattended many miles away, hundreds of miles away sometimes from base. Uh, and so you need to know that they're doing, you know, it's no good if you have to send in someone out there every uh, couple of days uh, to calibrate and validate the analyzer. Um, I say the, you know, the great advantage of online analyzers is that they can operate remotely uh, 200 miles away from home. The Achilles heel of many analyzers is that they are 200 miles away from home and you don't know if they're working properly. Uh, so this addresses that. Uh, Similarly, with remote health performance and diagnostics, uh, it's no good having to send someone 
out to an instrument 200 miles away to check that they're working. Um, almost certainly they will be working when they arrive and not working five minutes after they leave. Um, this, uh, our analyzers will send us a message uh, that there's something wrong. Uh, we will be able to analyze the files that come with those emails uh, to determine whether it's critical, uh, whether it's temporary. It may be that the air conditioning unit in the building in which our instrument is installed has failed and our instrument has stopped because it doesn't like the heat uh, or, the, or the cold. Uh, and so that will trigger us to call the, uh, many times the client doesn't know that because the building's 200 miles away from home. Uh, so uh, those diagnostics are essential uh, to keeping our analyzers working on a continuous basis. In fact, we're probably the only an uh, analyzer company uh, that can determine that, uh, the performance of our analyzer in this way, but also the uptime. Um, if analyzers are mission critical, uh, then it's, just, it's a good thing that they're available all of the time. You can have wonderful analyzers, but if it's only working 50% of the time, and you don't know which 50% of the time, uh, then they're not quite so valuable as um, something that's uh, available delivering data, mission critical data on a consistent basis. And I will touch on this later, but our analyzers in, have the capacity to do predictive analytics for two key contaminants of concern. I've touched on THMs, uh, but also lead, uh, which enables the consumer to be sure and the utility that's providing the consumer with the drinking water with these contaminants that uh, it's safe before they drink it. Uh, and we'll come to the implications of that uh, later on. So essentially what we're doing is providing water treatment uh, companies, enterprises, uh, with a brain. Uh, they will have bought a very expensive piece of uh, treatment equipment for removing a contaminant, uh, but that treatment uh, system is essentially like a muscle. Uh, it's on or off, it's faster or slower. However, it's, uh, it's unintelligent, it's stupid in fact. Uh, it doesn't know uh, whether it's going to have to run faster. It, um, uh, it doesn't know whether it's doing the job it should do. Uh, so, uh, and the client doesn't know whether the muscle is torn, broken, um, uh, got cramped. Uh, so it's very unintelligent. And what we bring to this uh, with our sensing technology and the fact that we're integrated uh, with the information systems of the client is total visibility. So if there's more of a contaminant coming towards the treatment system, it can be warned and adjust accordingly um, to ensure that throughout uh, the, um, the, eff the effluent from that treatment system is still meeting the standards expected of it. Or if there's less of that contaminant, go slower. Or if the muscle is torn, not working properly, um, uh, the system will shut down and uh, there won't be dead fish in the river and a blue lake in uh, Michigan Lake. So we enable uh, treatment systems from any of the vendors uh, treating the sort of contaminants we've talked about uh, to be intelligent and that's a really valuable proposition as we'll come to now. So uh, what's the point of all of this? What's the ROI from buying our instruments but essentially what's the ROI from the data we provide? And there are various ways in which our data is used uh, from the uh, less complicated to the more, more complicated. Um, the first is uh, called characterization, which is providing utilities and the engineers that advise them uh, high frequency data that enables them to understand what's going on in their water treatment system and where. Many times until now, um, clients have had to rely on laboratory samples, which by the definition are expensive and frequent, and it's very difficult to characterize what's going on in the water treatment system uh, which, uh, when the water quality can change dramatically from hour to hour uh, between night and day and across the seasons. So by having this um, intense data, um, the uh, remedial plans and actions can be uh, uh, developed uh, that are appropriate and much far more likely to be successful uh, than based on a few spotty uh, lab results. So it de-risks the whole design process and quite often can enable a client to actually make adjustments to their existing system without having to spend uh, huge amounts of capital. 
So that's an important ROI. Uh, then um, uh, there are situations where uh, upgrades or investment in treatment systems inevitable. Um, there's a process of selection, a uh, technology is selected and come the day of uh, installation. And uh, usually the acceptance process for new technologies takes a long time, far too long. Uh, because people are waiting to see what the results are coming back from the lab. And it's very difficult for the vendor to adjust the system and then have to wait another two weeks for the result. So we're used to um, ensure that, that you know, there's no finger pointing with the provider of independent data that assures the client that the technology is doing its job, uh, gives the vendor uh, the um, the data they need to prove that their system is working. Uh, or an alternative scenario, uh, and uh, some of you will be familiar with this, uh, new technologies are brought to market, uh, they need to be piloted somewhere. Uh, it's a lot easier to evaluate how a treatment system is operating if you're watching it from minute to minute, uh, than if you're grab grabbing occasional samples, um, you, uh, which is okay Monday to Friday, eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night, uh, but you want to be able to see that system running extensively. Um, the only way you can do that is with uh, real-time data. So we get involved in those type of projects too. But the real value added um, comes from uh, the next three categories where we're actually controlling, uh, as I described earlier, the treatment plant itself to ensure that uh, it's uh, performing as it should. But um, Without real-time data, the treatment, um, uh, the, the plant operator is like someone in a car without a speedometer. They don't know if they're going too fast and therefore um, subject to a fine because they've exceeded the speed limit or in this case, the regulatory limit. And for sure, they don't want to go too slowly uh, because if they're over-treating, uh, they're spending unnecessarily on energy, chemicals, um, and waste that's generated from the treatment process that could all be avoided. Yes, they need to be in compliance, uh, but they don't need to have eliminated uh, the contaminant concern uh, and clearly uh, vastly overspent for that. Uh, so a bit back to my uh, metaphor of Google Maps. Uh, this is keeping the treatment system on the straight and narrow. Uh, they're getting right to where they want to be in the most direct, uh, cost-effective way uh, possible. The, um, another application, uh, it's specific to certain contaminants, groundwater contaminants generally, uh, things like arsenic, where wells have very high levels of arsenic and are basically out of use, unless um, the utility can apply what's called a, um, a practice of a dilution is the solution. In other words, uh, taking water from a better quality well, uh, blending it, um, and producing a combined um, uh, product uh, that meets the specification by sort of averaging things out. Now, that can only work if there's constant monitoring because you know, should the water from the, um, the clean well um, you know, that be interrupted or uh, the levels of contaminant in the dirty well suddenly deteriorate unexpectedly, unless you can capture that immediately, uh, there's going to be a problem for the consumers uh, who uh, are receiving that water. So it's essential uh, that there's real-time monitoring of that blend um, to avoid nasty surprises. And finally, uh, risk management. So this is the use of data. It's a bit like the canary in the mine. Uh, this is when um, triggers are um, set off. Uh, the uh, analyzer has detected something that is uh, heading out of compliance may not yet be out of compliance, uh, but is heading in that direction. It can alarm, it can shut down a treatment system, uh, and it can give the operators the time uh, to react uh, before the fish turn up dead in the river. Or in the case of lead, um, in drinking water systems, uh, when usually, uh, uh, when there's a problem with lead, it's found because uh, it's found in children's blood, not because someone detected it, as a result, result of a sampling process. So this, um, this um, use of data is incredibly valuable, and I'll come back to some specific examples of that in a minute.
and here's one of them. So this is uh, an arsenic treatment system. This is real data uh, from, an, uh, from one of our clients. Uh, the regulatory limit for arsenic is uh, 10 uh, ppb. And in this case, uh, the client was treating their water down with a safety margin down to just below uh, somewhere between three and four ppb is what they targeted. And they were adding chemicals to, um, to drop out the arsenic. The blue dots are uh, what I referred to earlier as calibration and validation. So uh, the 10 ppb is the 25 uh, pound weight on your scales to ensure that um, the, uh, uh, the uh, analyzer is reading accurately. And the zero is before you step on the scales, you make sure that it's measuring zero. So uh, with those two results, we can have high confidence that when a measurement is taken, um, uh, the instrument having measured itself against those standards, um, it's going to be reliable. And so what happened on this particular day, uh, everything's chugging along very nicely until the moment that the coagulant that's being used to treat the arsenic it ran out. Uh, and you see the arsenic. Uh, jumping up to three times the EPA limit, uh, clearly very problematic. Uh, this particular client uh, had a buffer tank of coagulant, so that kicked in pretty, pretty quickly um, and dropped everything down to where it needed to be, below the 10 ppb. Uh, but then um, something else untoward happened and the, uh, the pump on the buffer tank failed. And again, you see the numbers uh, shooting up very quickly um, the client was able, was warned on this and was able to um, shut the system down, uh, restart the pump and um, bring the system back into compliance. So a very vivid example of uh, the value of this treatment system. Without that, uh, no one would have known that the, um, the, the plan B, the, uh, the buffer tank pump had failed and consumers would have undoubtedly been uh, receiving water uh, for an extended period of time with very dangerous levels of arsenic in it. And this was an unattended uh, well in on top of everything. Uh, so it could have been several days uh, before the consumers were aware of that. Uh, I use this slide because it explains the, the power of our predictive analytics. Um, so the THMs I referred to earlier, trilomethanes, uh, they're a very difficult um, contaminant to, to measure. And one of the problems of them is that you could have, um, the regulatory limit in the US, by the way, is 80 ppb. So you could have water leaving your treatment plant at, very safely at 5 ppb, um, but the chemistry of these contaminants is such that they could be at 120 ppb three days later, uh, 200 miles away. And um, that creates a problem because the the regulatory point for measuring these contaminants is actually the consumer's tap, not the water leaving the treatment plant. And so uh, you know, one possible solution to that is to put an analyzer near the consumer's tap. But of course, by the time the uh, water treatment plant operator knows that there's a quality problem, it's, uh, it's three days after they produce the water. Not very helpful because they've now got 200 miles of water, which is probably problematic. Uh, i.e. out of compliance and um, um, I'm not very good for the consumer. So what they really want and what we're able to, so the green line is actually the water being measured at the consumer's tap over that period. And then the red line is an analyzer at the water treatment plant, analyzing uh, the water uh, with some particular uh, techniques to um, in such a way as to predict what that water quality will be three days later at the consumer's tap. And uh, this data, of course, is invaluable. It's quite nice to know uh, what, it, what the level of THMs are leaving the water treatment plant, but obviously far more valuable is what will that water look like when it uh, reaches the consumer. And uh, on the basis of this data, the client is able to regulate their treatment system always to be uh, below 80 ppb um, uh, when the water gets to the client. So that's the use of predictive analytics. And we're the only people in the world that can do that. And we do it for many clients around uh, across the States and in Europe. 
And uh, this is the, um, the use of uh, online trace metal analyzer for predicting the risk of lead corrosion. As I indicated earlier, it's not very satisfactory. Uh, if lead is found at the consumer's tap, it's probably because it's been there for a while. Um, and often it's found at the consumer's tap after uh, children uh, have been detected with high lead in their blood, uh, which is what prompts a, uh, a lot of testing and then, and then the reality is discovered. Uh, we've adopted a different approach, uh, which is based on the fact that um, lead, um, lead corrosion can occur with service lines, uh, plumbing in houses, uh, brass fittings, um, but generally occurs because there's been a change in water chemistry. And that change in water chemistry provokes lead corrosion. Um, the change in chemistry can be quite subtle. Um, a number of parameters can come together to cause that to happen. And so um, what we're doing here is we've got an analyzer installed at the water treatment plant, uh, which is taking in a flow of the water that's eventually going to get to the consumer. And uh, two or three days later, and uh, we're passing that water over the typical substrates um, that uh, water would pass over on its way to the consumer's uh, glass or to their bath shower. And um, if there's a change in chemistry, uh, water chemistry, and that provokes a change in uh, the rates of lead corrosion, in other words, uh, the presence of lead increases substantially, dissolved or particulate, both, uh, we are measuring that on a continuous basis and we'll detect it. And then that, uh, that event will be um, alarmed. Uh, consumers can be warned of it uh, before the water gets to them um, or um, and uh, the, the utility as well and can take uh, and both can take uh, evasive action, whether that's to change the water chemistry or to um, on the part of the plant, treatment plant or um, uh, flush their water, pipe, water taps more often, um, replace their filters more frequently, drink bottled water, a number of, it, number of things they can do before uh, that water gets to them. And the truth is that the, uh, the impact on corrosion rates when something like that happens is very quick uh, and significant. Um, so some, the likelihood that sampling will capture that is, um, is pretty remote. Having said that, once the thing is triggered, um, then uh, we would apply um, uh, the use of our, our benchtop analyzer. So we know the zones of risk because they've got lead service lines or lead plumbing. And to, we can immediately start sampling, uh, well, not we, but somebody, uh, start sampling the zones at risk uh, over a period of time. Uh, multiple uh, samples can be taken and analyzed very, very quickly uh, to confirm whether uh, the lead risk has been realized uh, or the lead risk has passed. So I look upon this as a bit like as a fire alarm goes off on the uh, online lead monitor and then the fire warden comes around uh, to check, fire brigade comes around to check, in fact, if there was a fire. Uh, so uh, those two things together and with the rapid turnaround uh, that we get with the uh, the benchtop analyzer as peace of mind uh, delivered much more quickly uh, to where it needs to be delivered uh, and over time uh, with the analysis of that it becomes uh, possible to there define more clearly uh, homes at risk uh, or schools daycares um, and be in a position to act uh, to protect kids uh, particularly uh, from the risk of lead corrosion. So now turning to AMS environment. So this is a technology that we developed uh, based on the uh, electrolysis of uh, tin, uh, which um, uh, tin electrodes, essentially we're dissolving tin uh, in water um, and both tin and uh, what it changes into, tin dioxide in the presence of oxygen in the water, uh, are very powerful reagents. Uh, we haven't invented any of the applications of tin. Um, that's been well documented widely 
Um, um, and there's a white paper on our website for those that are very interested in it. So it's well documented. The problem has been delivering it in a controlled demand driven dose to the point of, point of need. And that's what we've, uh, we've developed and patented. So the only consumables for this, um, uh, this are tin. Uh, that's what the electrodes are um, made of. Uh, and uh, electricity. And the, uh, um, so all that we are delivering to site is a, uh, essentially uh, a tin generator, um, very modular. Uh, so as the electrodes get used, as they dissolve, it's a modular format. So the next set of, it's a bit like a large battery, um, long tube, um, think of a sort of uh, poster carrier, um, you know, wider and longer and thicker, depending on um, how much tin is required, um, for that sort of configuration. And um, uh, electricity is passed into the electrodes, dissolves, uh, and that water is then uh, treated uh, with the tin or the tin dioxide. I won't go into the, the, the weeds of that application, uh, but suffice to say, uh, it's a very, very effective um, um, reagents. And uh, obviously, uh, fully integrated with our uh, online analyzers uh, for full automation and remote control, what I described earlier. And it's particularly ideal, therefore, for unattended locations, which is often the case with many of these applications, uh, where there aren't people around every five minutes to check the cooling system or the arsenic well, the chrome well, and so on and so forth. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the beauties of this system is that it actually enables um, resource recovery. So selenium and the mercury are um, very present in, for example, coal ash, um, coal powered plant waste. A uh, conventional way of treating these is to um, bind them up with something and then bury them in toxic landfill under a mountain somewhere. Um, uh, it's pretty wasteful. Uh, selenium particularly is a valuable resource. It's got a, uh, it's traded on the commodity exchanges and uh, mercury is slightly less valuable, but it's still a value. And uh, particularly uh, in some ways of producing uh, hydrogen. That's the electrode uh, for that. And so we can recover this. Selenium is used in uh, solar voltaic um, panels, uh, lots of applications. So we can actually recover these contaminants. They have, they have value. Uh, and it's a much better way of, uh, of dealing with these contaminants than um, sticking them in a hole in the ground. And uh, we refer to this as our Christmas tree of applications. Um, down the left hand side, you see the. Um, uh, the contaminants, uh, for abbreviation, their uh, the chemical formula. Um, I apologize for that. And then the, the different markets to which they apply across the top. Um, very broad range, as you can see here, the global industries. Um, as I say, the, the application is well understood. We've just brought together the, uh, the way of delivering it in a uh, very controlled way. A particular interest, I think, um, uh, in terms of sheer scale is the application of this uh, to anti-corrosion in cooling systems uh, where today um, some pretty um, toxic challenging blends of chemicals are used uh, things like orthophosphates uh, phosphates are and definitely a non-renewable resource which are widely used in um, corrosion inhibition both in drinking water systems and in um, uh, uh, cooling systems and there um, the tin dioxide system has particular application it can act as a biocide as well uh, which is important in cooling systems um, which is a source of um, uh, biofilm and cooling systems is a very nice habitat for um, legionella uh, which is why uh, every year there are outbreaks of legionella around the world because cooling systems uh, have uh, um, uh, generated uh, Legionella, which has uh, got out into the, uh, the surrounding areas and um, particularly those that are vulnerable in hospitals and so on are exposed to it and have difficulty fighting it. So, uh, broad range of applications um, and um, airborne contaminants as well. Uh, 
Uh, so these are industrial uh, waste gases. Um, there are treatment systems today, uh, complicated, uh, costly, and uh, the, uh, our offering here is much simpler, uh, much more cost effective. And uh, um, it again extends the range of what we're able to do here. So this is a very, very exciting future for us. Uh, and this is as far as we've got. We, uh, we've been patenting over the last couple of years um, the treatment system itself um, and variants of it. Um, down the left-hand side are a series of contaminants uh, of concern. Hexavalent chrome is the Aaron Brockovich story. Uh, we started there and we actually started there because while we were doing the monitoring of those systems in California that I referred to earlier, the validation piece, uh, we could see that those treatment systems were not only not particularly reliable, uh, but um, uh, very, very costly. And uh, the uh, costs, um, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and we realized, saw that if there was going to be a, uh, a reduction in the regulatory limits for hexavalent chrome, a much more cost-effective system was required, which is what motivated um, uh, this invention. Um, it's now been trialed uh, in two systems um, and uh, um, widely evaluated. Uh, Arsenic, uh, we're heading down the same road uh, with Cal American, so a good reference, uh, and in New, um, New Berwick, Maine. Um, the arsenic limit we referred to earlier of 10 ppb is probably going to be lowered. It's already lower in New Jersey and New Hampshire. And as you can see from the table, uh, we are able to reduce. Um, arsenic uh, to below 3 ppb, uh, which would certainly facilitate uh, the introduction uh, of a much lower, uh, or reduction anyway, of the, uh, the limit from 10 to 5, uh, the federal limit from 10 to 5, um, pretty easily. So, and, and that's subject being uh, reviewed by the EPA as we talk. Iron is present in lots of worlds, and so we're at the early stage of evaluating uh, that in our New Jersey um, Innovation Center. Uh, I'll come back to what micropilots are in a second. Uh, Anti-corrosion I talked about earlier. Um, ironically, the Institute of Chemical Engineers in the UK has a new building where the corrosion system is uh, not performing at all well. And so we will be um, showing how the tin uh, system can um, treat for corrosion uh, beginning in um, the middle of September. Uh, the same sort of application for lead, uh, we've proven at bench scale. Uh, we're now, um, uh, would have probably started work in Scottsdale by now on um, lead corrosion in a particular building and, uh, and addressing that, uh, but COVID has delayed that for, um, for obvious reasons. And then um, a lot of interest from the coal industry uh, in terms of being able to recover uh, mercury and selenium. Um, so we've proven at a bench scale and now we're hoping with one of the uh, leading lights, I can't give you the name, uh, to um, uh, be able to deploy a pilot. And, um, and what a micro pilot. So yeah, we, um, the typical approach to a pilot is um, go on site, a lot of capital, a lot of time, a lot of people, uh, two or three months of setting up and planning and and and, 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 and therefore very expensive. A lot of money made by engineers um, and, uh, and then some results at the end of it. And uh, we've taken a different approach. Uh, we've said, well, firstly, uh, we can scale our, but we want to be able to demonstrate that we can scale our system from the scale of what we require for a home, uh, for lead treatment or chrome treatment, all the way up to a large water treatment plant. So why don't we take home scale and get the, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, client who's got a contamination problem to send us a sample of their water, very low cost. Uh, we put it on the uh, we put it on the machine. We plug in the analyzer, and hey presto, we've got results in minutes, and uh, we know whether we can treat it. Uh, very low cost, doesn't cost anyone anything really. And on the basis of that, uh, then it makes sense to deploy. But again, we would probably deploy the same system in the field. Uh, just because we want to um, convince the client uh, that it's working, uh, but also because yeah, the system is always different 
and subject to variability than taking 100 gallons and treating it off-site. Um, water quality changes and uh, temperatures change. So we need to be able to capture that all on site. But again, very easy to deploy. We deploy it in the back of a trailer. It's deployed in the morning and it's operating in the afternoon. And then we stream the data from the analyzers uh, to, um, to our offices so we don't have to have people on site. Again, very low cost. And that de-risks it for everybody. So when we talk about innovation, we're always thinking as well about how can we um, innovate, if you like, in the supply chain uh, to eliminate cost and generate data, uh, which is what all this is about, uh, in the most cost-effective way possible. And um, coming to cost effectiveness, uh, this is uh, a comparison of the costs of the traditional chrome treatment systems that I talked about earlier uh, with our own. So uh, the limit um, when, this, um, when these evaluations was done that the state had set and then had to withdraw because of the cost uh, was 10 PPB. And a lot of work was done uh, by engineers, uh, Corona, Hazen and Soy and others uh, to evaluate uh, various treatment systems for a large number of cities. And I've taken a number of those uh, to, um, to reflect the costs that were predicted uh, for those treatment systems. And as you can see, they're very, very substantial. Uh, those cost estimates covered about 67 wells. And uh, that's out of a total that would have been affected by the MCL of about uh, uh, 400. But even for those 67 wells, uh, consumers, the state was looking at a bill of about a half a billion dollars, huge number. Um, and then operating costs as well, because you've always got to look at the lifetime costs. So not many people evaluated that, which seemed a bit of a, uh, a miss, but anyway, uh, one did, um, Patterson, and you're looking at about $4 million a year uh, of annual operating costs, um, very substantial. So uh, we took our system, uh, our micropilot, uh, and we deployed it in Los Banos, uh, which has one of the highest and most complicated waters uh, to be treated um, in the state, uh, and Hidden Valley, uh, which is a small uh, underserved community. And uh, we deployed there, demonstrated their effectiveness. There's white papers on our website if you're really interested. And on the basis of that, uh, we are able to uh, estimate with a great deal of confidence what our system would cost um, in those two sites and by extrapolation and uh, understanding of those other systems which we are involved in monitoring um, uh, as part of those validation processes uh, we've got a pretty good handle on what uh, our costs would be both not only capital but operating so we're looking at um, you know round numbers say 100 million uh, compared to uh, 500 million, so a fifth of the cost uh, in terms of capital. Uh, and, and note here that we're eliminating uh, Chrome 6. We're not reducing it to just below 10 ppb, which is the cost that those uh, other technologies we're talking about. Um, uh, we're actually eliminating it. So it's not, it's not even quite apples to apples, but um, it, the, the difference would be even more exaggerated if we were to do it on apples to apples basis, if those technologies could get down to zero PPB, which they cannot. And then our operating costs, again, are at least based on the Patterson example, a fraction of the costs of um, what they would be. So this really makes um, uh, or removes the excuse for California not to introduce, reintroduce a, uh, a much lower hexavalent chrome uh, limit. Um, and um, which is required um, and at a much lower cost than uh, was originally projected. And it's really the advantage of uh, what technology can do in terms of changing the paradigm uh, when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with some of these contaminants of concern. Uh, so I hope you found that useful. Uh, it's a bit more technical than um, a normal presentation. But I hope it gives you some useful background, uh, not only into the technologies themselves, a bit, a bit about our philosophy of how we approach not only water quality monitoring, uh, but also uh, water treatment and how we see uh, innovation uh, bringing real benefits uh, to the, both those um, uh, different markets. So thank you very much.